Facilitating remote events, conversations, and meetings is really difficult. Despite the amazing growth of tools over the past couple of years, largely due to the pandemic, most remote events pretty well suck because we keep making the same mistakes. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the five biggest mistakes people make when they facilitate meetings and events remotely, what I call the biggest remote facilitation fails, and how you can fix them. What is up, friends? My name is Josh David Miller, AKA JDM of The Right Box. We make videos on innovation and entrepreneurship here on YouTube, and you can learn more about us at rightbox.co. But let's get to it. Here are the top five remote facilitation fails. Number five, ignoring the role of energy. In a lot of ways, it seems like everything is harder online. When we're remote or virtual, distractions are even easier. When you're in the same room, you can easily see as the facilitator who's engaged and whose attention is drifting. You can see if people are on their phones or their laptops, and you can even prohibit the use of those devices altogether. Not so when they're staring into the same screen that houses both their Zoom window and their email. Similarly, it's considerably more difficult to see where their attention is even directed. Are they looking at me? Are they looking at my slides? Are they looking at the poster on the wall? I facilitate with humor as well. Are my jokes landing or are they falling flat? But more insidious is this. The energy in a physical room of, of co-located people is actually just palpable by default. We feel it. Whereas in a virtual setting, it's actually completely absent by default. There's no energy in the room. And that energy in the room not only tells us a lot and sets the tone for participation, but it's also one of the best tools we have to increase engagement between participants. So how do we solve this? How do we combat the ease of distractions and the lack of energy? How do we take on the utter dullness of a virtual event? So I offer three tips, but the solutions to the other four mistakes that I'm gonna talk about next will actually dramatically help here too. Okay, but the three solutions. First, literally facilitate with more energy. It's so easy when you're facilitating remotely to fall into complacency and to just read the slides and convey information as if the performance doesn't matter. But ugh, the performance matters a great deal. Be yourself, put energy into it, but more than you would in a physical space. And that will spread out over the wire to your participants. They'll actually feel some of that energy coming through and it'll impact their mood and how they're interacting. Similarly, make use of background music or color commentary during heads down time. In a remote meeting, if everyone is working silently on their own, they're probably not working silently on their own. Uh, you gotta keep them engaged by giving them something on which to, to focus, like a sound, like music. Second, and very similarly, consider timing. And consider it carefully because dead space kills attention. Dead air kills attention. Keep the pacing up, right? Giving people only the time they need to work without much extra. And make sure that technical challenges are kept to a minimum. Do rehearsals and figure out how the technology is gonna work so that you can get around or through technology challenges pretty fast. On the flip side of timing, make use of breaks. If you're going more than 90 minutes without a break, it's incredibly draining for people. And in a lot of ways, virtual is even more draining than in person, particularly for certain kinds of people. So manage attention by keeping the pacing up to prevent our minds from getting bored and distracted by just the emptiness of it all, and take breaks to prevent our minds from getting distracted by the burnout of continuing to work on and on and on. The third way to combat dullness and apathy is to make use of video. Too often we consider video optional when we're in a virtual workshop or, or other event, and this does two things. First, as participants, it signals that we view this activity as second to an in-person gathering. It's not worth our video or video's optional because I'm kind of there but I'm not letting you be here. Second, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because we know there are fewer, if any, consequences for our own distraction. There's no peer pressure to pay attention because our peers can't actually see whether we are paying attention or not. So encourage participants, encourage your team to make use of their camera when possible. Okay, fail number four, not setting clear expectations. And in the case of a workshop, 
expectation setting is actually pretty straightforward because you're telling people, perhaps even you're telling them before they registered, exactly what they can expect to get out of the workshop. It's more about setting expectations for participants for what's supposed to happen at each point in the process. And if you're spending time explaining a concept, explain why you're taking the time to explain that concept. Why is it important to do that? And if you're having them do some kind of solo activity, set clear expectations around the parameters, such as the tools and the time available to complete the activity, but also on exactly what success looks like for that activity. An example we use in design sprints is called the crazy eights. And this is where we have a person make eight sketches in rapid succession. In a physical room, it's literally an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper folded in half, and then folded in half, and then folded in half, so that you have eight total boxes, little rectangles on this eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And in a very tight, compressed period of time, we have them sketch out eight different ideas related to whatever it is that we're, that we're talking about at that point in time. And the idea is quantity over quality. So success in doing the crazy eights is not doing two really good illustrations. It's doing eight really crappy illustrations of what we're trying to do. So you have to set clear expectations for what people are going to get out of it. In that case, the tool is the paper, the tool is the pencil, and then we have time as you're gonna get X number of minutes available, and honestly, it's usually several minutes. It's not very much time at all. And then we have clear expectations. You want to get eight crappy illustrations done, not two good ones. So workshops are straightforward. It's not very interesting. We're actually pretty used to doing this when we facilitate workshops because it's fairly similar to in-person, maybe with a little bit more instruction required. What about team meetings, such as retrospectives or decision-making sessions where there isn't necessarily like a workshop program that we've put together? How do you set clear expectations there? This is often where leaders commit the biggest mistake of any meeting, not knowing what the hell you wanna get out of it in the first place. Any event, any workshop, any meeting is a journey for the participants or, or for the team. They have a starting point, there's some process we're all going through, and they end up somewhere different than where they started. The key is figuring out where you wanna go and then working backwards to where you are right now. And that's what makes this facilitation. We are facilitating a process. So in a meeting, we have to make it clear to all present exactly where we are, exactly where we're going, and how we're gonna get there. We have to ensure that everyone knows what role they're playing in this process. And then we have to employ all the usual skills of facilitation to make that happen. And this leads directly to the next big fail. So fail number three, having an open discussion. It's fairly common in almost any decision-making session or in a workshop to require conversation, to have people communicate on an idea. We want to hear different people and we genuinely want to bring multiple perspectives to bear and we want to ensure that, that people feel heard oftentimes. So we do what we're told to do. We create space for people to talk. But this is very often misunderstood to mean that we create an empty space and allow people to enter or, or fill that space with their perspectives and opinions. So we create this void by asking really open-ended questions and waiting for someone to answer it. What do you think, we ask to the virtual room, but nature abhors a vacuum. So what happens, particularly online? Some people speak and you know who they are, but others won't. And even when they do, we, we don't know toward what we're actually working. We're just talking into the void. While so-called open discussions do have their place and are occasionally useful, the key lesson is this. Having no structure at all doesn't create space. Creating space is an intentional act that necessitates the definition of structure. What that structure looks like depends on what we're looking to accomplish. Since I mentioned retrospectives before, let's use that as an example. These are really common in agile software development, but I use them for all kinds of team projects. The goal is to understand in that endeavor what went well, where can we improve, and what the next steps are to realize that improvement. 
So at the conclusion of a project, we get everyone relevant together and we go through a defined process, none of which is an open discussion. To facilitate surfacing thoughts, I ask four questions and we collect answers to those using digital sticky notes. They're called the four L's. What did you like? What did you learn? What did you lack? And what did you long for? Each of those are actually starting points for further, also structured conversations. And by asking specific questions and providing specific tooling for the collection of answers, we actually create a really well-defined space for participants to express themselves. So don't throw your team or, or your participants into the void by having an open discussion. It probably won't go the way you want it to. Okay, the number two fail for remote facilitation, going for equity in hybrid events. We often think because we do workshops successfully online and we can do workshops successfully in person that uh, we can do a workshop successfully that is both online and in person at the same time, a so-called hybrid event. We think we can put on an event that is equally valuable for in-person and for remote participants. We can't. It's not possible. Now, there's a small asterisk there, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Most of us have probably been in a meeting before where we're calling in remotely and we're on a screen on the wall maybe with you know one or two other people, but we see like into the room where the rest of the team is. They're all together and we're one of the few remote attendees. It sucks, doesn't it? Like, it can be difficult to be heard, to get, a, to get a word in edgewise, and we always miss certain things that are just like happening in the room. It, it's just not the same as being there and we all know it. So when we're talking about facilitation, that problem is actually confounded because we have activities that have process behind them. And those activities look very different if we do them physically versus if we do them virtually. For example, I mentioned sticky notes. We can put sticky notes like on a business model canvas on the wall when we're together all in one room. But you put someone remote and they have to communicate to the room what to write on a sticky note and then where to place the sticky note on that business model canvas. It's unequal, it's unfair, and it's less productive. Similarly, if we're sketching, we can write on our, on our own piece of paper or you know, on a dry erase board, but the remote participants have to use a completely different tool for which they were likely never given proper instructions because everyone knows how to use paper by default, but they also have to use the same timing as everyone else even though they're using completely different tools. Alternatively, they can still use pen and paper, but then, you know, take a photo and upload it to a, a shared venue of some kind, some kind of shared drive. Either way, it takes time away. On the flip side, we can take time out of the session to incorporate all the materials together in a digital format and then share that out virtually. But now the in-person participants are left holding the bag. They have to go through extra steps or wait awkwardly for that process to complete. Yuck. And this is where the asterisk comes in. I said you can't achieve parity between in-person and online participants, and that's true. But a common workaround is to have in-person participants also use digital technology so that the playing field from a tool perspective and from a process perspective is fairly even, is fairly level. This works okay in some circumstances, but it does carry some caveats. First, it does introduce awkwardness for the in-person participants. They are likely doing something in a less natural way just because it's digital. And that's okay, I suppose, because at least there's equity between the online and in-person participants, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have intentionally sacrificed a great experience for the in-person participants in order to have a good experience for everyone. It's still a trade-off. Second, and this is a much bigger deal, Collaboration takes a major hit. Those who collaborate in person can just talk to those at their table. We can use the physical environment from the stage to those eight top round tables to the staff we have in the room to help facilitate. Those are not present online and we have to recreate them. But as we know, we can't mix in person and online participants in a group because equity can't exist. So we have to put online participants into teams digitally and then put the in-person participants into teams physically, but now we're running two events simultaneously. 
announcements, communications, and instructions, help from staff, all of it, it's done twice. It's just, it's just too much. And it's probably not even possible in the first place to create much of the, in, the, in the way of equity anyway. Think about, think about just even Q&A. How do you handle hand raising in a way that ensures fairness across those who are sitting at their tables or maybe standing in a line versus those who had to hit the little zoom button on it, right? I mean, again, yuck. So for all those reasons and many more, I stake my claim that hybrid events are not possible to be equitable. And this is my hill to die on. If I'm being honest, it's one of my many hills to die on. But we won't get into that here. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't do hybrid events. It means that we have to make a choice. Who gets the better experience? Those in person or those joining online? Put another way, whom are we intentionally gonna shaft with a subpar experience? If your event has an obvious answer to those questions, then you can do a hybrid event and do the best you can by balancing out all of the competing concerns, and that's okay. But don't kid yourself into thinking that you can create parity between those present physically and those present virtually. You just can't. And that's why this is the number two fail. Now that of course leaves fail number one, the biggest remote facilitation fail, ignoring the technology. This is the biggest mistake you can make. And it comes in a few forms. So let's break it down. First, we have a tendency to take what works offline and just move it online. We just copy the format right on over. But you absolutely cannot just take an in-person event and all its little structures and policies and procedures and tools and techniques and just throw it online. It just, it doesn't work. For example, you start by breaking down the parts. Everyone sits at a table. One person's on the stage talking and facilitating. They give instructions and the people in the room listen. Then maybe the people who are listening break out into groups and talk. So we pick technology that allows us to do all of that. There's a place with a stage where someone can talk and everyone else can come in and they can sit down and listen, usually off camera. And it also has a place where the participants can then maybe go somewhere else and work in groups. And that's probably on camera, so we'll recreate the tables there. It might sound reasonable on the surface, but this is actually one of the worst examples of this problem. And it's the most common. What we've done here is to turn our facilitated event into a webinar. Now, there's nothing wrong with webinars. They're actually fantastic for what they are. They're a means of disseminating information on a topic from a speaker to an audience with the potential to have some Q&A, maybe. It's a freaking YouTube video with primitive Q&A, and that's fine, but at its most reductive, it's like saying watching a TED Talk on YouTube is the same as watching one in person. But it's even worse than that because we're not even trying to create a TED Talk. We're trying to facilitate an experience that brings an outcome, and maybe even an experience that leads to a change in behavior. Experience. I'm gonna come back to that word in a minute. Okay, so if we wanted to change a TED Talk into a collaborative workshop, we'd use the room. We wouldn't have the audience in rows of seating. We'd have them at eight top tables, for example. We'd have materials present and sitting in front of them on top of those tables, the sticky notes, the pens, whatever else they needed. We'd have the staff walking around to help at strategic points to ensure that everyone's making momentum as we need them to. And probably more importantly, that they're making momentum in the right direction and not doing a bunch of work that isn't gonna help them later on. So our impulse virtually is to just solve each of those individually. We want people to work in groups, so let's add breakout rooms. We want people to collaborate virtually, so let's create a bunch of Miro boards or shared Google Docs or similar for the teams to all use, and so forth, each down the line of our checklist. We literally create this checklist of all the things we have to do in person and we recreate them virtually, one for one, this for that. But that ignores the experience. We do things the way we do in person because it's natural. It makes sense. It's fluid, it's easy. It makes for a good experience and a productive one. When we just replace a physical thing with a virtual thing, we end up with a string of these unrelated technologies and tools and processes and they don't really connect together. They don't actually like make a whole experience. It's just a bunch of disjointed stuff. Something as simple as sharing a sketch becomes a big challenge. 
In person, we take two seconds, draw a little something, and then we just hold it up. Look at this. This is what I mean. This here. Virtually, we can't hold up paper and, and see very well, so maybe we take pictures of them and then upload them? Screen share? It's certainly not as easy as just, hey, look at this. So then we replace that whole experience with some digital drawing tool. But how many of us can actually convey what we want to when we draw a picture with our mouse? It's like the worst game of Pictionary ever. And it's still disjointed because it doesn't fit into the flow. It's not, hey, look at this. The environment isn't an environment. It's a bunch of little things, little environments that we strung together and it's fine at best. So we don't want to replace physical things with digital things. We want to replace what those physical things bring to the experience with some brand new combination of tools and processes that when we combine them together, create a comparable experience. We have to take it holistically, not tool by tool, but we have to think about the experience and recreate the experience from scratch virtually. It's like martial arts. To the samurai, the sword is an extension of the body. To move the sword is to move the body. It becomes part of them. It's an extension of the arm. For us, our tools have to be an extension of the experience. They're part of it. It all becomes self-evident when taken as a whole. Okay, so to sum this part up, you have to make the technology you're using the atmosphere of the experience. The technology is the atmosphere, just like you would the room of a physical venue. You make it the atmosphere and you create the room to deliver an experience. But what you don't do virtually is take that room and try to recreate the room virtually because the room was serving an experience that we can't deliver online. So whatever experience we want to deliver online, we need to create a new room. That room, whatever it is, needs to be designed to facilitate the experience that you want to create. So my friends, those are my top five fails when facilitating remotely. It was a tough list to gather. Some things almost made the cut. It was difficult to prioritize, but those what I think are the top five most important ones. And that's it for this video. If you found this video at least mildly interesting, or dare I say helpful, I'd really appreciate you tapping that like button. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, you might want to consider subscribing because we're just getting started. And in the meantime, here's a video you might like. Check it out. I'm actually just going to hang out here until you click that video. No, really. I'll wait.